What is software testing? Software testing is a process to identify the correctness, completeness, and quality of developed computer software. It includes a set of activities conducted with the intent of finding errors in software so that it could be corrected before the product is released to the end users. In simple words, software testing is an activity to check that the software system is defect free. Why is testing important? This is China Airlines Airbus A300 crashing due to a software bug on April 26, 1994, killing 264 innocent lives. Software bugs can potentially cause monetary and human loss. History is full of such examples. In 1985, Canada's Therac-25 radiation therapy machine malfunctioned due to a software bug and delivered lethal radiation doses to patients, leaving three people dead and critically injuring three others. In April of 1999, a software bug caused the failure of a $1.2 billion military satellite launch, the costliest accident in history. In May of 1996, a software bug caused the bank accounts of 823 customers of a major U.S. bank to be credited with 920 million U.S. dollars. As you see, testing is important because software bugs can be expensive or even dangerous. As Paul Ehrlich puts it, to err is human, but to really foul things up, you need a computer. Consider a scenario where you are moving a file from folder A to folder B. Think of all the possible ways you can test this. Pause the tutorial and think over the exercise. Apart from the usual scenarios, you can also test the following conditions. Trying to move the file when it is open. You do not have the security rights to paste the file in folder B. Folder B is on a shared drive and storage capacity is full. Folder B already has a file with the same name. In fact, the list is endless. Or suppose you have 15 input fields to test, each having five possible values. The number of combinations to be tested would be 5 raised to 15. If you were to test all the possible combinations, project execution time and costs will rise exponentially. Hence, one of the testing principles states that exhaustive testing is not possible. Instead, we need the optimal amount of testing based on the risk assessment of the application. And the million dollar question is, how do you determine this risk? To answer this, let's do an exercise. In your opinion, which operation is most likely to cause your operating system to fail? I'm sure most of you would have guessed opening 10 heavy graphics applications all at the same time. So if you were testing this operating system, you would realize that defects are likely to be found in a multitasking module, and that needs to be tested thoroughly. Which brings us to our next principle, defect clustering, which states that a small number of modules contain most of the defects detected. With experience, you can identify such risky modules. But this approach has its own problems. If the same tests are repeated over and over again, eventually the same test cases will no longer find new bugs. This is another principle of testing called pesticide paradox. To overcome this, the test cases need to be regularly reviewed and revised, adding new and different test cases to help find more defects. But even after all this sweat and hard work in testing, you can never claim your product is bug-free. To drive home this point, Let's see this video of the public launch of Windows 98. Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build... Whoa. <laughs> Moving right.
Come must, on. That must, be, uh, that must be why we're not shipping Windows 98 yet. You would think a company like Microsoft would have tested their OS thoroughly and would not risk their reputation just to see their OS crashing during its public launch. Hence, the testing principle states that testing shows the presence of defects. Testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects remaining in the software. But even if no defects are found, it is not a proof of correctness or a proof that no defects remain in the system. But what if you work extra hard, taking all precaution and making sure your software product is 99% bug-free and the software does not meet the needs and requirements of the client? Which leads us to our next principle, which states that absence of error is a fallacy. Finding and fixing defects does not help if the system build is unusable and does not fulfill the user's needs and requirements. To fix this problem, the next principle of testing, early testing, states that testing should start as early as possible in the software development life cycle so that any defects in the requirements or design phase are captured as well. We'll have more on this principle in a later tutorial. And the last principle of testing states that the testing is context dependent, which basically means that the way you test an e-commerce site will be different from the way you test a commercial off-the-shelf application. Before we close this tutorial, here's a quick recap of the seven testing principles. Suppose you are assigned a task to develop a custom software for a client. Each block below represents a step required to develop the software. Irrespective of your technical background, try and make an educated guess about the sequence of steps you will follow to achieve the task. The correct sequence would be gather as much information as possible about the details and specifications of the desired software from the client. This is nothing but the requirements gathering stage. Plan the programming language like Java, PHP, .NET, and database like Oracle, MySQL, etc., which will best suit the project. Also determine high-level functions and architecture. This is the design stage. Actually code the software. This is the build stage. Next, you test the software to verify that it is built as per the specifications given by the client. This is the test stage. Once your software product is ready, you may do some code changes to accommodate enhancements requested by the client. This would be the maintenance stage. All these levels constitute the waterfall method of a software development lifecycle. As you may observe, Testing in the model starts only after implementation is done, but if you are working on a large project where the systems are complex, it's easy to miss key details in the requirements phase itself. In such cases, an entirely wrong product will be delivered to the client. You will have to start afresh with the project. Or if you manage to note the requirements correctly, but make serious mistakes in design and architecture of your software, you will have to redesign the entire software to correct the error. Assessments of thousands of projects have shown that defects introduced during requirements and design make up close to half of the total number of defects. Also, the costs of fixing a defect increases across the development lifecycle. The earlier in the lifecycle a defect is detected, the cheaper it is to fix. As they say, a stitch in time saves nine. To address this concern, the V model of testing was developed. For every phase in the development life cycle, there is a corresponding testing phase. The left side of the model is the Software Development Life Cycle, SDLC. The right side of the model is the Software Test Life Cycle, STLC. The entire figure looks like a V, hence the name V model. In this figure, you'll find a few stages different from the waterfall method. These differences, along with the details of each testing phase, 
will be discussed in a later tutorial. Apart from the V model, there are iterative development models, where development is carried out in phases, with each phase adding a functionality to the software. Each phase comprises of its own independent set of development and testing activities. Good examples of development life cycles following the iterative method are rapid application development and agile development. Before we close this tutorial, here are a few pointers. You must note that there are numerous development life cycle models. The development model selected for a project depends on the aims and goals of that project. Testing is not a standalone activity, and it has to adapt with the development model chosen for the project. In any model, testing should be performed at all levels, right from requirements gathering all the way up to maintenance. Let's consider a scenario to understand the testing life cycle. You work for an IT outsourcing company as part of the testing team, and your company is hired by a bank to develop an online banking application. To understand the testing life cycle, let's first quickly go through the development life cycle. During requirement analysis phase, after series of meetings the client decides he wants the following five functionalities into a system. Login, on valid credentials. View current bank account balance. Deposit money. Withdraw money. Transfer money to a third-party account. Next, in the functional specification stage. Architecture, database, and operating environment design are finalized. Next, in high-level design stage. The application is broken down in module and programs. In detailed design stage, the pseudocode for functions for each module is documented. Next, actual coding begins. This is the software development cycle of the V model. During all these phases, the tester is not sitting idle for the coding to complete, but is doing corresponding testing activities. Let's look at them one by one. Unit testing. It is also called component testing. It is performed on a standalone module to check whether it is developed correctly. For the login module, which may look like this after development, typical unit test cases would be check response for valid login and password, check response for invalid login and password, check response when login is empty and login button is pressed. Unit test is done by developers, but in practical world, developers are either reluctant to test their own code or do not have time to unit test. Many a times, much of the unit testing is done by testers. System testing is concerned with behavior of the system as a whole. Unlike integration testing, which focuses on data transfer amongst modules, system testing checks complete end-to-end -end scenarios as the way a customer would use the system. A good example of test case in this phase would be login into the banking application, check current balance, transfer some money, log out. Apart from functional, non-functional requirements like performance, reliability etc. are also checked during system testing. Acceptance testing. Acceptance test is usually done at client location by the client once all the defects found in system testing phase are fixed. Focus of acceptance test is not to find defects but to check whether the software system meets their requirements. Since this is the first time the client sees their requirements, which is plain text, into an actual working system, Acceptance testing can be done in two ways. Alpha testing a small set of employees of the client, in our case employees of the bank, will use the system as the end user would. Beta testing a small set of customers, in our case bank account holders, will use the software. 
and recommend changes. Integration testing. In this phase of testing, individual modules are combined and tested as a group. Data transfer between the modules is tested thoroughly. Integration testing is carried out by testers. Consider this integration testing scenario. In a banking application, a customer is using the current balance module. His balance is 1000. He navigates to the transfer module and transfers 500 to a third-party account. The customer navigates back to the current balance module, and now his latest balance should be 500. The modules in this project are assigned to five different developers to reduce coding time. Coder 2 is ready with the current balance module. Coder 5 is not ready with the transfer module required to test your integration scenario. What do you do in such a situation? One approach is to use Big Bang Integration Testing, where you wait for all modules to be developed before you begin testing. The major disadvantage is that it increases project execution time, since testers will be sitting idle until all modules are developed. Also, it becomes difficult to trace the root cause of defects. Alternatively, you could use the incremental approach where modules are checked for integration as and when they are available. Consider that the transfer module is yet to be developed, but the current balance module is ready. You will create a stub, which will accept and give back data to the current balance module. Note that this is not a complete implementation of the transfer module, which will have lots of checks like whether the third-party account number is entered correct, the amount to transfer should not be more than the amount available in the account, and so on. But it will just simulate the data transfer that takes place between the two modules to facilitate testing. On the contrary, if the transfer module is ready but the current balance module is not developed, you will create a driver to simulate transfer between the modules. To increase the effectiveness of the integration testing, you may use a top-to-down approach, where higher level modules are tested first. This technique will require creation of stubs. Or you may use a bottom-up approach, where lower-level modules are tested first. This technique will require creation of drivers. Other approaches would be functional increment and sandwich, which is a combination of top-to-down and bottom-to-up. The choice of approach chosen depends on the system architecture and the location of high-risk modules. Consider a scenario when after fixing defects of integration testing, the software is made available to the testing team for the system testing. You look at the initial screen, system looks fine, and delay system test execution for the next day since you have other critical testing tasks to attend to. Next day say you plan to execute the scenario. Login, view balance, transfer 500, log out. The deadline is 4 hours. You begin executing the scenario. You enter a valid login ID, password, click the login button, and boom! You are taken to a blank screen with absolutely no links, no buttons, and nowhere for you to proceed. This is not a figment of any imagination, but a very practical condition which could arise due to developer negligence, time pressures, test environment configuration and instability, etc. To fix this issue developer requires at least 5 hours. And deadline would be missed. In fact, none of your team members will be able to execute their respective scenario, since view balance is start point to perform any other operation. And the entire project will be delayed. Had you checked this yesterday itself, the system would have been fixed by now and you would have been good for testing. To avoid such situation, sanity, also known as smoke testing is done, to check critical functionalities of the system, before it is accepted for major testing.
sanity testing is quick and is non-exhaustive. Goal is not to find defects but to check system health. Suppose in the current balance module, instead of just showing the current balance, the client now wants customized reports. Based on date, amount of transaction, obviously any such change needs to be tested. Once deployed, testing enhancements, system changes or corrections forms part of maintenance testing. Suppose in our banking application your current balance is 2000. Using the new enhancement, you check your balance, for a year ago, which comes out to be 500. You enter the transfer module and try to transfer 1000. In order to proceed, the transfer module checks for the current balance. But instead of sending the current balance, it sends the old balance of 500, and transaction fails. As you may observe, code changes were in current balance module only, but still transfer module is affected. Regression testing is carried out to check modification in software has not caused unintended adverse side effects. Apart from functional testing, non-functional requirements like performance, usability, load factor are also important. How many times have you seen such long load time messages while accessing an application? I am sure many. To address this issue, performance testing is carried out to check and fine-tune system response times. The goal of performance testing is to reduce response time to an acceptable level. Or you may have seen messages like, hence load testing is carried out to check systems performance at different loads, that is number of users accessing the system. Depending on the results, and expected usage more system resources may be added. That's all to types of testing. In general there are three testing types. Functional. Non-functional. Maintenance. Under these types you have multiple testing levels, usually called as testing types. You may find some difference in this classification, in different resource, but the general theme remains the same. This is not the complete list as there are more than 150 types of testing. No need to bother or worry. You will pick them up as you age in the testing industry. Also, note that not all testing types are applicable to all projects but depends on nature and scope of the project. More on this in a later tutorial. Thanks for listening. As a beginner, it's easy to assume the testing is executing various section of code on an ad hoc basis and verifying the results. But in real world, Testing is a very formal activity, and is documented in detail. The degree of formality depends on the type of application under test, standards followed by your organization, and maturity of the development process. The importance of documentation will be highlighted in the succeeding tutorials. For all hands-on, we will be using the flight reservation application which comes bundled with automation tool. QTP. To get this application either install QTP or use the link given below. Tutorials on this site, for QTP and LoadRunner use flight reservation. Therefore we have selected flight reservation to reduce your learning curve, while studying QTP and LoadRunner. Below, find link to introduction video to flight reservation application. Do watch it. A test scenario is any functionality of the application under test that can be tested. It is also called test condition or test possibility. For the flight reservation application, a few scenarios would be Check the login functionality. Check that a new order can be created. Check that an existing order can be opened. Check that a user can fax an order. Check that the information displayed in the help section is correct. 
check that the information displayed in About section, like version, program or name, copyright information is correct. Apart from these six scenarios, try and list all the other possible scenarios for the application. Pause the tutorial and complete the exercise. I am sure you have identified many a more like, update order, delete order, check reports, check graphs, and so on. For the time being, let's stick to these six. Next, we have already learned that exhaustive testing is not possible. Suppose you have time to execute only four out of these six scenarios. Which two low priority scenarios of these six will you eliminate? Think, your time starts now. I am sure most of you would have guessed scenarios 5 and 6, since they are not the core functionality of the application. This is nothing but test prioritization. Now, consider a scenario, where the client gives a request to add, send order via email functionality, to flight reservation, he also specifies the GUI fields and buttons he wants. Even though this functionality is yet to be developed, try and create a few test cases for this requirement, pause the tutorial and complete the exercise. A few test cases, amongst the many you could have thought of would be Check response when valid email ID is entered, and send is pressed. Check response when invalid email ID is entered, and send is pressed. Check response when email ID is empty, and send is pressed. You may have realized that, to create test cases, you need to look at something to base your test on. This is nothing but, test basis. This test basis could be, the actual application under test, abbreviated as, AUT. Or maybe, even your experience. But most of the times, like in this case, tests would be based on documents. In fact, this is what happens during the different phases of eModel, where test plans are created using the corresponding documents. And once the code is ready, testing is done. Consider a test scenario to check login functionality. There are many possible variations to check this scenario. Check response on entering a valid agent name and password. Check response on entering an invalid agent name and password. Check response when the agent name is empty and the login button is pressed. And many more. This is nothing but a test case. Test scenarios are rather vague and cover a wide range of possibilities. Testing is all about being very specific, hence we need test cases. Now just consider the test case check response on entering a valid agent name and password. It's obvious that this test case needs input values, agent name and password. This is nothing but test data. Identifying test data can be time consuming and may sometimes require creating test data afresh for that reason, it needs to be documented. Before we proceed, consider a quote from a witty man. To ensure perfect aim, shoot first and call whatever you hit the target. But if you do not live by this philosophy, which I am sure most of you do not, then your test case must have an expected result. For our test case, the expected result would be login should be successful. If expected results are not documented, we may miss out on small differences in calculations in results which otherwise look okay. Consider this example, where you are calculating monthly pay for an employee which involves lots of calculations. The need for documenting expected results becomes obvious. 
Suppose the author of the test case has left the organization, is on vacation, is sick and off-duty, or is just very busy with other critical tasks, and you are recently hired and have been asked to execute the test case. Since you are new, it would certainly help to have test steps documented, which in this case would be launch the application, enter an agent name, enter a password, and click OK. You may think that for these simple test steps, documentation is not required, but what if your test steps look something like this? I think the need will become immediately obvious. That apart, your test case may have fields like a precondition, which specifies things which must be in place before the test can run. For our test case, a precondition would be flight reservation application should be installed. Also, your test case may include a post condition, which specifies anything that applies after the test case completes. For our test case, a post condition would be time and date of login is stored in the database. During test case execution, you will document the results observed in the actual results column and may even attach some screenshots. Based on comparison of actual and expected results, assign pass and fail status. This entire table may be created in Word, Excel, or any other test management tool. That's all to test case design. Below you will find links to download a sample test case specification template. Consider a scenario where the client changes the requirement, something so frequent in the practical world, and adds a field, recipient name, to the functionality. So now, you need to enter email ID and name to send a mail. Obviously, you will need to change your test cases to meet this new requirement. But, now your test case suite is very large, and it is very difficult to trace the test cases affected by the change. Instead, if the requirements were numbered and were referenced in the test case suite, it would have been very easy to track the test cases that are affected. This is nothing but traceability. The traceability matrix links a business requirement to its corresponding functional requirement right up to the corresponding test cases. If a test case fails, Traceability helps determine the corresponding functionality easily. It also helps ensure that all requirements are tested. We have already learned that exhaustive testing is not possible. So we need techniques to identify test cases with the most likelihood of finding a defect out of the possible many. There are many test case designing techniques available. Let's look at them, one by one. Equivalence partitioning. It is a black box technique, which can be applied to all levels of testing like unit, integration, system, etc. A black box technique is a technique where the code is not visible to the tester. In this technique, you divide a set of test conditions into partitions that can be considered the same. To understand this with an example, let's consider the behavior of tickets in the flight reservation application while booking a new flight. Ticket values 1 to 10 are considered valid and ticket is booked for these values. Values 11 to 99 are considered invalid and the error message only 10 tickets may be ordered at one time is shown. On entering values 100 and above, the ticket number defaults to a two-digit number. On entering values 0 and below, the ticket defaults to 1. We cannot test all the possible values, because if done, number of test cases will be more than 100. To address this problem, we use equivalence partitioning. We divide the possible values of tickets into groups or sets where the system behavior can be considered the same. These sets are called equivalence partitions or equivalence classes. Then we pick only one value from each partition for testing. 
The hypothesis behind this technique is that if one condition or value in a partition passes, all others will also pass. Likewise, if one condition in a partition fails, all other conditions in that partition will fail. That is all to equivalence partitioning. Next technique is boundary value analysis. In this technique, you test boundaries between partitions. As in our earlier example, instead of checking one value from each partition, you will check the values at the boundaries like 0, 1, 10, 11 and so on. Boundary value analysis is also called range checking. Equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis are closely related and are generally used together at all levels of testing. Decision table testing technique is a good way to deal with combination of inputs which produce different results. To understand this, with an example, let's consider the behavior of flight button on different combinations of fly from and fly to. When both fly from and fly to are not set, the flight icon is disabled. In the decision table, we register values false for fly from and fly to. And the outcome which is flight's button will be disabled that is false. Next, when fly from is set, but fly to is not set, flight button is disabled. Corresponding you register true for fly from in the decision table. And rest of the entries are false. When fly from is not set but fly to is set, flight button is disabled, and you make entries in the decision table. Lastly, only when both fly to and fly from are set, flight's button is enabled, and you make corresponding entry in the decision table. If you observe the outcomes for Rule 1, 2, and 3 remain the same, so you can select any one of them, and Rule 4 for your testing. The significance of this technique becomes immediately clear, as the number of inputs increases. Number of possible combinations is given by 2 raised to n, where n is the number of inputs. For n equals 10, which is very common in web-based testing, having big input forms, the number of combinations will be 1024. Obviously you cannot test all the combinations, but you will choose a rich subset of the possible combinations using decision-based testing technique. State transitioning diagram is helpful where you need to test different system transitions. To understand this with an example, let's consider the behavior of login screen of flight reservation application. Consider you have entered agent name in the login screen. On first attempt, you enter correct password, and you are given access to the application. In case you entered incorrect password, an error screen is shown and you are asked to enter the password again, the second time. You can make three attempts. But if at the fourth attempt, you enter incorrect password, the application will be closed. In case you enter correct password at the second, third, or fourth attempt, you will be given access to the application. Amongst these various system transitions, the scenario of access at first attempt and close of application at fourth attempt are important and need to be essentially tested. But scenario of access at two, three and fourth attempt are less important and perhaps you can test one of them. This diagram is called state chart or state graph. There are four main components of the graph states that the software may occupy transition from one state to other events that cause transition actions that result from events state graph is useful for identifying valid transitions but if you want to determine invalid transitions you can use state table in a state table 
All the valid states are listed on the left side of the table and the events that cause them on the top. Each cell represents the state system will move to when the corresponding event occurs. For example, while in S1 state you enter correct password, you are taken to state S6. Or in case you enter incorrect password, you are taken to state S2. Likewise you can determine all other states. If you observe, two invalid states are highlighted using this method. Which basically means, what happens when you are already logged into the application, and you open another instance of flight reservation, and enter valid or invalid passwords, for the same agent. System response for such a scenario can be tested. Use case testing. This technique helps identify test cases that cover the entire system on a transaction by transaction basis from start to finish. A use case is description of a particular use of the system by an actor also called user. The technique is used widely in developing tests at system or acceptance level. In use case, an actor is represented by a and system bias. First we list the main success scenario. Consider the first step of an end-to-end -end scenario for login functionality of flight reservation application, where the actor enters agent name and password. In the next step, system will validate the password. Next, if password is correct, access is granted. There can be extension of this use case. If password is not valid, system will display message and ask for retry four times. Or if password is not valid at the fourth time, system will close the application. Here we will test the success scenario in one case of each extension. Review In simple words, review is a meeting where people analyze a software work product and recommend changes with the objective of improving quality. The software work product could be a design document, system requirement specifications, code, test plan, etc. It helps in detecting defects early in the development life cycle and reduces costs. Almost always, the testing team is part of the review meetings. To understand the review in detail, let's consider the same example as earlier to add email functionality to flight reservation application for which the functional design document is prepared by the technical lead. He approaches his manager and requests to initiate a review. The manager will quickly go through the document and check whether the document is of acceptable quality to request a review by other people, for example, in this case. He finds a few spelling mistakes and asks the technical lead to correct them. Once corrected, the manager will send out a meeting request to all stakeholders, along with meeting location information, date and time of meeting, and will mention the agenda for the meeting. He will also attach the functional design document itself to the meeting request for reference. This is the planning stage. Next stage is the kickoff meeting. It is an optional stage. Here, the goal is to get everybody on the same wavelength regarding the document under review. It is beneficial for new or highly complex projects. Next stage is the preparation stage, where 
review meeting participants individually go through the document to identify defects, comments, and questions to be asked during the review meeting. This phase is necessary to ensure that during the meeting, participants focus on subject in hand instead of daydreaming. This is your exercise. For this functional design document think of the details missing, required to help you test this functionality, pause the tutorial and think. Let's continue with the next stage which is the actual review meeting. Here the meeting participants are assigned different roles to increase the effectiveness of the meeting. The moderator is a role usually played by the manager who leads the review meeting and sets the agenda. The creator of the document under review plays the role of author who reads the document and invites comments. The task of the reviewer is to communicate any defects in the work product. Suppose one of the reviewer says it would be nice to have a reset button. The author agrees to this suggestion. Another review comment is, there is no mention as to where in the menu item, the email functionality will appear. Again the author accepts and agrees to make changes. The meeting participant, playing the role of the scribe, also known as recorder, will note down these defect or suggestions. One young reviewer suggests the possibility of sharing a ticket via social networking sites like Facebook, Oracut and so on. The author strongly disagrees to this, and the reviewer and the author enter into a heated argument. At this juncture, the moderator intervenes and finds an amiable solution which is to ask the client whether he needs sharing via social networking. Finally, all comments are discussed, and the scribe gives a list of defects, comments, suggestions that the author needs to incorporate into his work product. The moderator then closes the review meeting. That is all to the meeting phase of the review. The important roles here are the moderator, the author, the scribe, the reviewers, the moderator and scribe can also play the role of reviewer, meaning they can give review comments to the author. The next phase of the review is the rework phase, where the author will make changes in the document as per the action items of the meeting. In the follow-up phase, the moderator will circulate the rework document to all review participants to ensure that all changes have been included satisfactorily. That is all to a review process. The various stages of a review process are This was a generic review. Note that there are three types of reviews, walkthrough, which is led by author, technical review, which is led by a trained moderator with no management participation, inspection, which is led by a trained moderator and uses entry and exit criteria. All these three types follow the same review process and the same stages as discussed earlier. Let's do an exercise. For the flight reservation application, prepare a work breakdown structure of the various testing tasks like check login functionality, check new order functionality, check fax functionality, and other similar functionalities, and estimate the effort required to test these functionalities. For example, login functionality can be tested in two hours. Likewise, prepare a list of all the tasks and corresponding effort. Pause the tutorial and complete the exercise. I hope you made an educated guess on the effort required. This is bottom-up strategy for test estimation. The technique is called bottom-up, since based on the tasks which is at the lowest level of the work breakdown hierarchy. You estimate the duration, dependencies and resources. In bottom-up strategy, estimates are not taken by a single person, but all individual contributors, experts and experienced staff members collectively give estimates. The idea is to draw on the collaborative wisdom of the team members, 
to arrive at accurate test estimates. Now, since you have considerable experience on the flight reservation application, use this experience to estimate the effort required for full functional testing of the website, dutours.demo.com. This site is functionally identical to the flight reservation application, just that it is web-based. Pause the tutorial and do the exercise. I hope, based on your experience you came up with a good estimate on the effort required to test the website. This is the top-down approach to estimation, which is based on experience. Another technique is to classify application based on their size and complexity and then seeing how long a project of a particular size and complexity have taken in past. Another approach is determining average effort per test case in past for similar projects and then using estimated test cases of the current project and arriving at total effort. More sophisticated estimation models involve complex mathematical models. In practice, Majority of the projects use top-down approach for estimation. Test estimates can be affected by many factors like timing pressures, people factors, geographic distribution of the test team and so on. That is all to estimation. A test plan is often confused with test case suite. To understand the nitty-gritty of a test plan, let's develop a test plan for Flight Reservation Application In a previous tutorial, we have already informed that there are more than 150 types of testing and you cannot possibly test your application for all the different types. For the Flight Reservation Application, you might want to test the application to examine how it works when installed on different operating systems. But testing it to check how it works for different browsers does not make sense since it is not a web-based application. Based on this contextual analysis, you can make a list of testing types that are in scope and will be tested, and testing types that are out of scope and will not be executed for flight reservation. Risk could be any future event with a negative consequence. You need to identify the risks associated with your project. Risks are of two types. First, project risks. Example of such risk is Senior team member leaving the project abruptly Every risk is assigned a likelihood, that is chance of it occurring, typically on a scale of 1 to 10. Also the impact of that risk is identified on a scale of 1 to 10. But just identifying the risk is not enough. You need to identify a mitigation. In this case mitigation could be knowledge transfer to other team members, and having a buffer tester in place. The second type of risks are product risks. An example of a product risk would be flight reservation system not installing and test environment. Mitigation in this case would be conducting a smoke or sanity testing. Accordingly, you will make changes in your scope items to include sanity testing. This is risk-based strategy of testing. There are many other testing strategies to help you select testing types for your application under test. Most of the times your out-of-scope items will not contain out-of-context testing types. But in context testing types, excluded due to the test strategy chosen, budget, and timing considerations. So for example, if timing considerations do not permit performance testing, it will move from in-scope to out-of-scope list. That apart, a test plan will contain information about the test estimates, test team, schedule, and so on. A test plan helps monitor the progress of various testing activities and helps take controlling action in case of any deviations from the planned activities. That is a brief overview of how to create a test plan Below find a sample test plan template for your reference. While executing test cases, you may find that actual results vary from the expected results. This is nothing but a defect, also called incident, bug, problem or issues. In case you find a defect, 
What information would you convey to a developer to help him understand the defect? Pause the tutorial and think. Your bug report should contain following information. Defect ID, unique identification number for the defect. Defect description, detailed description of the defect including information about the module in which defect was found. Version, version of the application in which defect was found. Steps, detailed steps along with screenshots with which the developer can reproduce the defect. Date raised, date when the defect is raised. Reference, wherein you provide reference to the documents like requirements, design, architecture or maybe even screenshots of the error to help understand the defect, detected by, name or ID of the tester who raised the defect. Your bug report, will also contain following information, status, status of the defect, more on this later. Fixed by, name or ID of the developer who fixed it. Date closed. Date when the defect is closed. Look at this sample bug report, for your reference. This apart, your bug report will also include, severity, which describes the impact of the defect on the application. Priority, which is related to defect fixing urgency. Severity and priority could be high, medium or low based on the impact and urgency at which the defect should be fixed respectively. A defect could have a very low severity but a high priority. For example, if there is an error in the text of the logo of flight reservation application, its severity is low since it can be fixed very easily and it does not affect any functionality of the system. But it needs to be fixed at high priority since you do not want to ship out your product with the incorrect logo. Likewise, a defect could be high severity but low priority. Suppose there is a problem with email functionality of flight reservation. This defect has high severity since it causes the application to crash. But the functionality is scheduled to release in next cycle, and can be fixed later, which makes it a low priority. From discovery to resolution, a defect moves through a definite life cycle, called the defect life cycle. Let's look into it. Suppose, a tester finds a defect. The defect is assigned a status, new. The defect is assigned to development project manager, who will analyze the defect. He will check whether it is a valid defect. Consider that on the flight reservation application, the only valid password is Mercury, but you test the application for some random password, which causes logon failure, and report it as defect. Such defects, due to corrupted test data, misconfigurations in the test environment, invalid expected results etc. are assigned a status rejected. If not, the defect is checked whether it is in scope. Suppose, you find a problem with the email functionality but it is not part of the current release. Such defects are postponed. Next, manager checks whether a similar defect was raised earlier. If yes, defect is assigned a status duplicate. If no, the defect is assigned to developer who starts fixing the code. During this stage defect is assigned a status, in progress. Once, code is fixed. Defect is assigned a status, fixed. Next, the tester will retest the code. In case the test case passes, the defect is closed. If the test cases fails again, the defect is reopened and assigned to the developer. Consider a situation where during the first release of flight reservation a defect was found in fax order, which was fixed and assigned a status closed. During the second upgrade release, the same defect again resurfaced. In such cases, a closed defect will be reopened. That is all to bug life cycle.